All right, everybody, welcome to the collegesoccernews.com podcast. I am your host, Adam Zunnel. I'm here with Arkansas head coach Colby Hale. Coach, uh, great start to the season. It's a start to the season. We're almost uh, to, to the end of it here. So um, just kind of give us a, a thumbnail about uh, about where you all are as, as we do shift here towards the latter part of the season. Yeah, first of all, I appreciate you guys having me on. Um, yeah, it was good. Like we, we knew the team had a chance to be good. You know, we've been to a couple of elite eights. We returned a bunch of players, had a good class coming in, you know, freshmen are always a little, um, you don't know how they're going to adapt some quite quickly. And then some take a little while, but what we've done is some research and teams go to the final four are pretty old, you know, mostly speaking. So we knew that we had a bunch of returning players. So we scheduled about as hard as you can. And, um, you know, we started off some home games did really well. And then we went at Notre Dame at UNC at Clemson at Tennessee, we played home Grand Canyon on one day rest. We got in at one o'clock, played on Sunday at noon. Uh, and then we went Alabama at A&M at Missouri, right? Six of eight, five top 15 teams, four of them on the road. And we knew it would be difficult. And if I'm being honest, it was even more difficult than I thought it would be. I mean, we were just, we won A&M in Missouri, but we kind of, we, we were retired physically, mentally, all of us, myself included. Um, and I would do it again. I thought it was great preparation. We want to be an elite program, but it definitely, it definitely wore us out. Right. So we took, you know, we played on Thursday against Missouri. We took Friday, Saturday, uh, all day, Sunday, we trained Sunday night and the kids came out flying. Right. I think it was a great reset for us. We called it reset Sunday. Just kind of did some fun competition days, played, went to goal. Um, yeah. And I think we're, I think we're ready to rock and roll right now. Take us behind the scenes of that <clears throat> that week you already alluded to, that September 15th through 21st, where you had the three games and you had, I think it was Tennessee and Grand Canyon. Can, can you take us behind baseball on what led to a, a game with with the one-day rest and the scheduling quirks that maybe came up with that? Yeah, I mean, we like to do difficult things. The reality is, and so you play in the NCAA tournament on one-day rest, right? So everything we do has a reason, and we were like, hey, this is this is why we're doing this. This is potentially potentially, you know, uh, an NCAA tournament weekend. So, you know, the difference is we were away and I don't know if you know the story, but we fly same day, we fly charter. So we fly same day while our bus, like there was a wreck and the bus didn't show up on time at Tennessee. And so we had to kick the game back and you know, we had a bunch of travel issues and we got back at about midnight on Friday night, maybe actually a little later and then played at noon on Sunday. Right. So the thought process was if we do difficult things, it preps us in the future. Um, and I thought it was valuable experience, right? Like we learned what it takes. Now we'll be more fit as the season goes on, but I think the, the, the finding way to go two and zero in that weekend was huge. Yeah. I mean, that was what, when I, when I was looking at that did look like an NCAA tournament, um, thing. And that's not something that teams normally expose themselves in the regular season to, because usually you say, we're going to, we're going to test ourselves because we're of who we play and we're going to see those things, but the format of, of not just, uh, I mean, I'm not sure what exactly the, the conference tournament format, but it is many games in a short amount of time. Um, so it's interesting that you went through that process to test your team. Is this the first time that you've done a squid scheduling, um, um, so no, 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 we've done, we've done it in the past. Yeah, we've done it in the past. We did a couple of years ago with um, UT Martin. They were a good team. And, um, you know, for us, it's like, I think a lot of teams, it's the old Anse Endurance way, right? Like a lot of teams are trying to find, hey, how can we make sure everything is in our favor, which I do think helps if you're trying to win a game in the short term, but it doesn't help you long term. You know, if our goal is to make runs in the NCAA tournament, go to a Final Four, win a national championship, we have to have had some of those experiences. And, you know, I think Anson Dorrance is the GOAT. He's the greatest. And, you know, if you ask him about his scheduling philosophy, it's always been all comers anywhere, anytime, any place. And that's what we want to do, right? And, um, you know, this would this certainly was a tough schedule. If 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 we weren't as old, we might have doubted back just a little bit. But, you know, it was great for us. And don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, after we finished Missouri, we were all pretty grumpy and tired and ready to get away from each other for a little bit. And we took a few days off and we came out Sunday night and they were flying. What did you learn about your team? You, you mentioned some of that stretch, the Notre Dames and North Carolina's Clemson, uh, even Tennessee in, in conference. What did you learn about your team and maybe some of the um, ways that you are kind of building and progressing through the through the year? Yeah, I mean, so we wanted to know what can we do against those teams, right? I didn't want the first team that we play, played in North Carolina to be in the NCAA tournament. And now we're trying to figure out what can we do and what can we not do. I mean, we have some non-negotiables, some principles of play that we're not going to go away from. But within there, there's a lot of wiggle room of kind of tweaks and stuff of how you win games. So for those games, we literally just 3-4-3, three, three, let's go. Um, pin the ears back and see what we could do. Right. And, you know, we had some ACC refs and all those calls didn't go our way. We just said at the end, like, Hey, we may have to play in one of these environments and some calls don't go our way then too. Like we have to find a way to win the game. The NCAA tournament's not going to say, Hey, 
you know, you got some calls that didn't go your way, but we're going to advance you anyways. Like that's not how it works. So, um, yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, we, we dealt with just about everything you could travel issues, weather, hot, cold. I mean, we feel pretty prepared. And when it come time to win some in, you know, Missouri and A&M was tough and we were pretty worn out physically and mentally. We did not play very well in either of those games. Both of those games on the road, we found ways to win one zero, right? And, um, you know, we had a, a starting goalkeeper go play for the national team. So we had a freshman in goal. I mean, just a lot of stuff. And our team doesn't blink. You know, they don't say, oh, we can't, we, we don't have excuses. You know, we kind of say excuses are for losers. So for us, it's like, no, how do we win the game? This is the 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 challenge that's ahead of us and, and let's attack it. Obviously, you have that program at a, at a super high trajectory and, and path, uh, path right now. Um, how have you seen the SEC as a conference, though, grow, you know, and and you have been among the programs that have been at towards the top of that heap, but but over the, you know, the decade that, that you've been there, decade plus, how have you seen it kind of kind of grow? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's been fantastic. And it's a commitment from money and facilities and hiring coaches. And, you know, I mean, the SEC is the greatest conference, right? And in, in athletics, it just means more. It's a real thing. And, you know, I think that gap is going to continue to grow as you see the TV money and some of that stuff continue to change. And, you know, like we kind of tell our players, like, if you're going to talk about national championships, first of all, you have to be close enough to, for that to be a, you can't be five and 15 and talk about national championships. There's a bunch of steps in between five and 15 and that. So we're, we're close enough. We're not there. Um, and then the second thing is you have to have support from administration. You know, we have a fantastic administration that supports us. They're building this new facility. We travel for the most part, like we need to. Um, and we have the resources we need. We're able to hire the top staff. I mean, we have a strength coach that's only ours, a dietitian that's only ours, an athletic trainer that's only ours. And those things go a long ways if you're trying to build a pro a pro model. Tell me about the recruitment of Anna Potagil and and the and the pitch that you made to her. And also, you only recruit players you think are going to be good and great. Yeah. So, uh, but not everybody turns out that way. Is there anything that you saw and then you felt compelled to or is some of this even still kind of like you know a little bit of a oh I'm glad this worked out no 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 I mean me and everyone in America knew she was going to be good I mean there's some kids where you're like oh I mean she is such an elite athlete um yeah I mean that, that was there was there wasn't a whole lot of concern with that one or question um uh, and the recruitment was different like like we they just came out with the stats since 2019 we've scored 100 more conference goals than the next closest person in our league we scored 250. The next close is 150. If you want to score goals, come here. If you want to pass it around the back and play one zero, have at it, but that ain't us. And the Fords like to cut the Fords like that, right? I mean, we always joke that people recruit against us, like to, you know, bad mouth it against. But if winning and scoring goals are the two most fun things in soccer, and we think they are, we do them better than everyone. We've won more than everyone in the league since 2019. We've scored more goals than anyone in the league since 2019. You know, and then there's, it's not the only way to do it. Like, we don't, we don't say to Anna, like, hey, we do it the right way. We just say, hey, this is what we do. And, you know, I mean, South Carolina does it totally. They've got to lead the world in one nil wins, right? Like that staff has done a tremendous job. They're very, very consistent. They perform at an elite level every year. And every year they'll lose some players, but they still perform well. They do it a very different way. And I have a ton of respect for them. Um, but, you know, us and them are probably the two that have done it pretty consistently over the past six, seven years. You know, Alabama had a pretty good last year. Um, and there's been some kind of one-offs, but, you know, you'd probably have to see us in South Carolina right now are the, um, are, are, are the most consistent, you know, last year was a rebuilding year. We lost some generational players and Parker Goins and Taylor Malum and Kayla McKeon and Haley Van Fossen tons. I mean, there were some like Cora Dunnick a one year. I mean, I think we had so many fifth years and, you know, when they, when they left, I think there's a real sense of like, okay, is that was, was Arkansas about Parker Goins and we just challenged the team. That's cool. You guys can be a rebuilding year. There's nothing wrong with being in a rebuilding year and the Razorback soccer, like you guys will be the rebuilding year. And it was done to needle them against and, and uh, needle them again a little bit. And they did not like it. And they were out to prove to the world. Right. And went on a little run um, at the end. And, you know, it, it wasn't all without its um, challenges last year. We had to kind of figure out who we were outside of some of that. And, you know, to their credit, they figured it out and elite eight at Florida state, you know, one nil own goal corner kick on a miss hit serve by night swung and the only miss hit serve she hit all year. So, but that's what it is. And, you know, close is only good hand grenades. And, you know, so for us, it's like, we're not there and we need to get there and we're excited about trying to get there. How did you try and um, evaluate this team and what it needed um, to, to prepare for this year? And obviously somebody that jumps off the page is Emma White and her success. How did, how has she blended in and how, what sort of ingredients were you looking as you started to cook uh, cook this year 
That's a great question. And I think one of the things I learned about year three, four, five, six is like, when you have a good year, you're like ready to write books and do seminars and everyone should come and you have the magic pill on winning. And what you learn is every team is different. And if you just rinse and repeat and apply what happened last year to next year's team, it's probably not going to work. Even if you have the same players, because there's a new dynamic, there's new challenges. Are they dealing with lack of confidence? Are they overconfident? Are they pissed off? They didn't get the polls. Like, you know, there's always some unique ones. So it takes us a while, you know, this year's team, we talk about this team just wants to compete. You know, if it's information overload, um, it's, it's not always the best recipe for this team. And so most of the games we are, we're starting to move towards are like competitive. Even when we do set pieces, we have to make it competitive. It's a walkthrough. This team kind of gets bored. I don't know if this is this generation. I don't know what it is, but like if we walk through, it's just okay. If we add a score to it, they kill it. So even like we go over corner kicks, we go live and we keep score. And, you know, we do activation on uh, match day in the morning and we turned it into competition. We have a year long four square competition where it's Dutch style. You have a different team. And I mean, they cuss and swear at each other and yell out and laugh and, you know, they have a blast, but that's how we activate, right? If we just, you know, let's get some bands and do it. Um, it doesn't go as well. So for this particular team, a, maybe a little more fun, a little more competition, a little less information. I think this team thrives. What's your process to evaluating and, and kind of understanding what each team needs as you learn that each team's got to be a little bit different? How do you go about listening and understanding and talking to assistants and players? What's your process and in, in, in timeline, I guess, too, because you don't want to learn this too late about kind of figuring out what the team needs. Yeah, no, you, you, I mean, you hit it on the head. Like it is, it is trial and error. It's like, okay, well that didn't work. Like, okay, that didn't work. And then you, you start asking them questions and listening and talking with your staff. And, you know, like, I don't, I don't know that it's like a one answer, like, Hey, this is this it's, it's kind of like as a coach, as we get older, we got to put more tools into our tool belt, but then where we really make our money is knowing which tool to use, right? Like, is it the screwdriver? Is it the saw? Is it the, you know, and you just got to kind of know like, Hey, is it a time to push them and lean on them and help them grow and get them outside their comfort zone? Is it time to challenge them? Is it time to encourage them? Is it time to, you know, Sunday, we literally, I didn't say a word. We put up a couple goals. We have a wall game game. We played, you know, we, we did this, we kind of made it fun. We did a, um, pays to be a winner. So winner stays, third team comes on and we had a cup of adversity. So the third, the, the winners had to drink from the cup of adversity, which was like these little white pieces of paper in the cup. And it was like down a goal, down two goals, bad ref, you know, whatever. So the, the winners had to draw from that, whatever they drew, that's how they had to play the game. Right. So, and we did, Something the other day, the team wasn't communicating well, so we blindfolded them while we played handball. And like, we're trying to keep it fresh and different. If if I get lazy, but expect them to keep growing, I mean, they're going to call me out on it. Well, let, let, if I can tug on that thread a little bit, um, when did you learn and realize that you needed to go through that process? You said kind of you, years two, three, and four. Was there an experience where you realized you can't use a template and roll it out every year and and do those sorts of things? Did you have some, what were some of those moments like where you realized that you needed to continue to progress yeah. for your program too? Yeah. And, and part of that's who I am, right? I'm a pretty obsessed with learning and growing. I listen to tons of podcasts. I read, I do all this stuff, talk with people. Um, so some of that's just who I am, but so my first year, you know, the program had never been good, never been to the Lens Bay tournament hadn't, you know, so when I got here, we went nine, 10 and one, they gave me a raise and an extension. And I was like, okay, this coaching thing's pretty easy. Second year, sweet 16, I was writing some books. And then year three was, was a bit of a challenge. Right. And as that, that group from two to three, the year two was like, just tell us what to do when we want to win year three was kind of like coach chill. We know now, like now you don't have to be hard on us anymore. Cause we're good. And then year four was honestly a bit of a train wreck. So, you know, I just learned like, okay, this is every team's going to have a new challenge. Every team's going to have a new group of people. And it is not cut and paste, man. It is just not. And he, like, sometimes you figure out like that group with Parker and Kayla, when they were seniors, I swear to you, I could not, I wouldn't, I didn't even have to be there that season. And they wouldn't have won the league. If I did not come to practice, if I took a semester sabbatical, they would have won. Like they were so old. They were so mature, sure. I, I, they didn't need me. And that's kind of what you want. And I was there and I just try not to screw it up. Then other years you're trying to, you know, push some buttons and different buttons and change shapes and all this stuff. And so, um, you know, this, this year's a, this year's a pretty good group of older players. You got some really good leaders, some returners, you sprinkle in a couple of transfers, you sprinkle in some young ones, um, you know, and at our best, we're going to score a, a lot of goals. Um, but we've won, you know, a couple games, one, Oh, we've won a game five, two. Like, I mean, we feel like we can win games different ways. 
as you've gone through the NCAA tournament and runs like that, have you learned any, uh, it sounds so, so simplistic, but what about postseason play is different? That is, that is true from year to year to year that you, are there any universals that you've learned that can help you uh, when it comes November and, and December? Yeah. Playing at home helps like get seating, right? Like in the NCAA tournament, this isn't college basketball. But I think we did a stat like 91% of the final four over the last 10 years have been one or two seeds. And that's because they play at home. And, you know, not that, I mean, John, actually one of my staff members was one of the few that uh, went to a final four with Washington state and they went on the road and then you had Santa Clara won it, but that was during COVID. So they're all not, they were all neutral site games. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's number one, you, you, you your season matters. You got to schedule, you got to try to get in a high RPI so it can be a one or a two seed. And then the second one is this, the second one is you have to have been through some stuff. You know, there's that whole sports psychology. What is it? You know, storm norm form or whatever. And like you go through something and then it kind of forms and that becomes your norm. Like you have to go through some stuff during the season. So you know who you are. So when it comes time to be in pressure situations, your team isn't, you know, struggling with those that they're ready. That's why we make, that's why we make our schedule difficult. That's why we make training difficult. You know, um, you know, we tell people this isn't all rainbows and unicorns and we don't think it should be. And this isn't for everybody, but if you want to win, you want to score goals and you want to be pushed as a person and a player, you will love this. And, you know, the players have the confidence to tell me when I'm wrong. You know, they come to me and say, hey, coach, that that was that was not good or we didn't like that or that was not cool or whatever it is. And, you know, they, they I will listen to whatever they say as long as you're putting the program first. You know, we kind of do a special ops thing in the preseason. They say mission first um, team always, which is just like, you know, our ultimate goal is to win a national championship. Like this is not a family. This is a soccer team. I'm not your dad. Uh, I don't mean that we're not relational. We are. Um, and I will love you and care about you, but I'm not your dad. I'm your soccer coach. That's, you know, we're, you are coming here to win soccer games and get an education and we are help you grow up a little bit, but, you know, don't put those family dynamics on us. So um, we're very clear on the recruiting process and we get kids who want to be here and want to win and want to grow and want to, you know, most of them want to go pro. And because of that, we don't have a lot of attrition. I, I, I love the way that you've said that, particularly about, <clears throat> you know, the family dynamics and, and, and taking the part that that people try to mean when they say that, but also taking part the stuff that they don't and, and really kind of addressing that head on. And the other thing, and I've heard you talk about this uh, on another show that I really think is worth is worth mentioning is you're not shy about the goals and leaning into them and and embracing being ranked or being unranked or whatever and, and meeting those things head on. Can you tell me a little bit about, about your approach to just address it, it talking about things as, the, as they really are. Yeah. I mean, what I learned is a team is pretty much a reflection of you. So all the things that I, you know, complain and whine about my team ever it's, by, it, I just have learned like, well, I need to look in the mirror because it's probably a reflection of me. And so I need to make sure that, you know, we're pushing and we're growing and no one, I don't want anyone in our program to be comfortable. And, you know, there's a million ways to do this. I don't want anyone to be comfortable. I don't want anyone to say, oh, okay, now we've won some games. Now, you know, like I was listening to another podcast and they were saying that, you know, with our style of play, we've hit our ceiling. My first thought is if our ceiling is sixth in the country, it's still pretty stinking good, right? Especially since no one had even been to an tournament. Second is it's not a ceiling. Like that's just where we're at. And we are continuing to grow and try to push that ceiling and to do that, you have to talk about it. We're very upfront and honest and open. Like we have roles on our team and what those roles are important for. And, you know, we say like, there's a, there's a lot of what I think are fallacies in the NCAA. And it's like, if we're not careful, we're not going to do right by the players. So when we recruit the kids, we say, Hey, here's how I parent. Like, this is the same way. I believe in honesty. I believe in pushing you. And I don't believe in giving you whatever you want. So if my kid, I have a, I have a seven-year-old, she asks for candy every morning. She's not getting candy, right? Why? Because that's not good for her. She needs to eat healthy and well. And so that's what we say. And if that's not how you parent, well, don't come to Arkansas because you want to experience this as love. Like, doesn't mean it isn't love. It just means there's lots of ways to show it. So what we do is we say, here's what this is. We're not trying to recruit you. We're trying to find fit. And those players who have the same core values as us and the same values. And I don't mean that like core value and mission, all that gets super watered down. I mean that legit, like what, if you believe that you grow outside your comfort zone and the best way to grow is to be pushed. And then you will love this. And if you do not want that, don't come here, but don't like, we always say like, when I, when I first started, you asked about evolution. It was like, I was trying to be this all American buffet. Like, I want to make sure if you want a pizza or a taco or a 
steak or some ice cream. We have it all. And I was like, man, first of all, I stink at that. And second of all, I don't think you're going to do anything well. So let's just be the best Mexican food restaurant in the history of the world. And if you want Mexican, come on, let's go. But don't come here and then complain we don't have egg rolls because that's not what this is, right? Like, that's not what this is. And um, and we're cool with that. And, and what we have found is there's a lot of people who are pretty passionate about winning, who believe in, in, in the same things we do. And when you combine those all together, I mean, we don't have rules. We don't need them. We don't have issues with our team. We have no drama. We have no issues. We don't have kids transfer. I mean, our roster is probably too big, but it's because the players, for the most part, are buying into what we do. And even when they leave, it's not contentious. It's like, hey, I just want a bigger role. I mean, I got text message from dad saying, you know, it was great two years. She just wanted a bigger role. Thank you so much for everything. Awesome. Where can we help you go? I will help you go to my most hated enemy if that's what's best for you because, you know, you only get to do college once. Um, I think I asked uh, Coach Penske this last year, um, but in your opinion, have kids changed? You talked about a generation a little bit, but have kids changed or has the world changed and that makes us think that kids have changed? Well, first of all, I think every generation always says the young <laughs> problem with the young people, right? Like, right. so I think to answer your question globally, no, right? Have kids changed? Well, of course they have. Like, the, the, people are going to change, but I don't think the disparity between the old and the young is any different than it's ever been. It's just we're now the old people who are like, get off my lawn and turn your music down. So for me, no. And, and we actually talk about with the players and I challenge like, hey, this is what the world says about your generation. Are you okay with that? Like, is that who you want to be? What we have found, though, is it is very important that we find like-minded people. So we don't just go to a field, hey, that's a good player, let's go. Like, we Zoom with their parents and we talk openly about what do you think this is? What do you want from your experience? So, like, one thing I say is the world is like, oh, the, it's my job to make sure every player has a good experience. Why is that my job, right? Like, I want you to have a good experience really, really badly. But like, so if you don't make a travel roster and that hurts your feelings and you had a bad experience, that's on me. Like I can only take 24 people, right? The way you, the way you interpret everything, all of your experiences is up to you. I'm not talking about the extreme cases of like abuse and stuff. I'm just talking about how do you view adversity? And if you didn't make a travel roster, get in a game, did that make you better? Or did that make your experience bad? So I want everyone to have a good experience, but that's not my job, right? My, my job is to create an environment, be honest with you in the recruiting process and provide opportunity. I tell all the players when I, when Arkansas hired me, it was not an attractive job and the candidate pool. I mean, I was like the only moron who would take the job, to be honest with you. I was the assistant at UCF. I was not highly sought after. And when they offered me the job, they said, do you want it? I said, yep. And my wife was like, what do you make? And I said, I did not ask. And I had a bunch of friends saying like, oh, it's when you get the job. That's when you negotiate. It's just not what I believe in. And she was like, what about your contract? I was like, I didn't ask. What about your budget? I don't know. I didn't ask. Like, I just figured this was my opportunity. If I did really well, I'd get a raise and extension and the budget would grow. If I sucked, they would fire me and I would probably have deserved that. So I just wanted the opportunity. And that's what I tell the players. Like, this is an opportunity. We will support you. We will love you. We will care about you. We'll give you every resource to be successful. We have 30 some players, only 16 of them, 17 of them can play. You cannot all play. Like, it's just math. If the only way that I can care about you is through playing time, you're creating an environment which I cannot succeed. So you will feel valued if you help us, if you help this program continue to move forward. I mean, we have some kids who don't play very big roles, if none on the field, and they would tell you today, they help us win every day by who they are as people. It's helping them grow. And even though I'm sure they would rather a role on the field, there's some pretty superhuman people that are doing an unbelievable job of helping this program uh, grow, even though it's not necessarily the role, role they hope for. Do you think you can just riff on this? Do you think that there are coaches out there that are afraid of the transfer portal and 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 of of being uh, and try to be a buffet? I guess maybe too much. So, absolutely, absolutely, and we're not. I, I am not afraid of it. Like, listen, we this is how we do it. We are looking for fit. I'm not. I'm not the best coach for everybody in America and you're not the best player for everybody in America, right? This is about finding a fit and finding someone who you think is going to bring the best out of you. And if that is not me and you get here and figure that out, no questions asked, where do you want to go? Let's help you find a place. I'll call some people for you. Like we're not holding people hostage here. And if, if a player wants to leave, I will support them wholeheartedly because, and it's not a like, oh, well, good riddance. Like, no, like it, it, the recruiting is hard because you got to kind of figure out and there's some unknowns on both ends and how you're going to translate all of your talents and, and our culture into one, you know, cornucopia of like success. And sometimes it just doesn't jive and that's cool. 
but we don't act out of fear. And I tell the players this all the time. I mean, on our group text the other day, they, some of the seniors got someone and it said, just F and go for it. And they're like, if we've ever learned anything, that's what we've learned from this program is just go for it. We're going to schedule that way. We're going to coach that way. We're going to play that way. We do not do things out of fear. There's this, we used this last year, all year was the Maverick theme song. It's my favorite song. The girls always give me crap. And, um, or my, that's my favorite movie. So at the beginning, he's like 10.0, not 10.1, not 10.2. And he said, I don't look to, like the look on your face. He said, it's the only one I got. Like, that's, that's what this is. It's the only one we got. Like, we're going to blow the plane up. Like we just are. And even though you tell us don't go 10.1 or 10.2, I'm not afraid about what people say about us. I'm not afraid of failure. I'm not afraid of scheduling. I'm not afraid of the transfer portal. We're going to attack it. And, you know, in that, you're going to take some lumps, right? Like we, we, we went at Notre Dame at UNC at Clemson right in a row on the road and we went oh one and oh one and two oh two and one and you know some people will be like uh we got so much better we know who we are if I played those teams again I know what we would do and it also sends the message of like if we're going to ask you to overcome your fears face them and just go after it and we played a soft schedule like we would be hypocrites so for us it is 100% like how do we make sure that everything we do lines up with what we believe is a program all right, I got a couple more as I'm just enjoying this. I noticed something when you're uh, listening to a couple interviews with your players, and th I'm hoping this is something maybe the first time you've ever been asked, but they all refer to you by your first name. Mm -hmm. Is that has that been purposeful um, for for you in, in that way? Um, and when did that kind of come about? I I don't know. I I don't care what they call me, and I've told them that since the start. I think. I don't know where it came from. It's definitely not intentional. I mean, there's a there's a lady who does our games who um, still calls me Coach Hale, like, and I coached her 12 years ago. So I have no idea where that came from. I don't. I honestly, I don't care. Like, if they could call me whatever they want, um, it's not really important to me. You know, because one thing here's what's interesting. One thing we talk about, and this is kind of a philosophy, is I think there's like all these cliches in the sports world and we all just fall into them because they sound great. Like, well, if we win, it's them. And if we lose, it's the coach. Like what? Like if we lose, it's on all of us. And if we win, it's on all of us. Like we're in this together. If this gets, we call it SFP, solve freaking problems. Meaning if your job is to identify all the problems and it's my job to fix them, that seems kind of one-sided. Like you're just as smart, if not smarter than me. And there's 38 of you. Like if there's an issue with our program and there's going to be, let's come up with solutions. Let's make it better. Your job is to leave the program better than you found it. Not to just come here and be like, oh, hey, I survived and I played in a few soccer games. Like you need to leave a mark. And with that is coming, have conversations. And like the other day, I had a kid text me about scholarship and it literally was just like, hey, can I have more money? And I called her and I was like, okay, okay, first of all, don't do that. Text me and say, come to me and say, hey, can we sit down and talk and then come prepare? So made her go back, come back the next day and say, okay, here's why I need more money. Here's where I think I've earned it. Like that's a, that's a real person conversation. You're not gonna, I'm not gonna text Hunter. Hey, Hunter, gonna have a raise, you know? Like, so I want them to learn real life lessons. So she's gonna come back in and say, okay, here's my rent went up and here's, you know what, here's why I'd like more money. And okay, let's have an adult conversation about this. I just believe in fundamentally like sports at its very best prepares people for life. And the world has gotten away from it a little bit. Like everyone gets a ribbon. We don't want people to deal with failure. It's going to hurt their confidence. And that's cool. That's just not how we do it, right? I believe that you can learn. My most, I tell the players this, we had a, we didn't have a couple good years right in the middle of my career here. And a lot of that was me, right? I, I think I got a little big for my britches. I got a little, you know, hey, I'm so awesome. And I'm not that awesome, right? I, I need to stay humble, work hard. And those were my most important years because when I was winning, I was like, hey, I'm awesome. And when I wasn't, that's when I was reevaluating everything and talking to people and reading books. And, you know, we say to the players all the time, we have to stay hardworking and humble. Confidence is good, but we are, we have not arrived. We win a national championship and we will ask the next day, how do we continue to grow and get better? Um, all right. That's, and I, I just going back on that. I mean, I think the fact that you don't care, I think that's the point. I mean, you know what I mean? Like what they call you because you have created, it seems like a fact where it's not a uh, hierarchy, but it's a collective amongst amongst everybody. Um, all right, let's kind of get back to the season here. I, although I've enjoyed that probably more than any of the philosophical discussions. Um, back to the field and in, in your home field in particular, been so good at home. You talked about how important home, home field advantage is the, in the NCAA tournament, but 
as you talk about growing the sport and being successful and 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 doing so well at home, how, how much pride do you have in 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 what you've built there from a from a fan and and um um you know home 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 field advantage? Oh, it's I, I mean I love it and I, and I love the holisticness of if the, I don't even know if that's a word, but the holisticness of what this is, right? Like, listen, we want to win and we're passionate about it. We want social media to be the best. And I think our social media guys do an awesome job and we lean on them hard and we want, you know, everything we do to be the best. And our fans are, a lot of people say it and they're just, ours are the best and they're loud, they're big, they impact the game. You know, and we play with a lot of emotion, right? I mean, we're not afraid to say that. Like some people are like, hey, let's take the emotion out of it and, you know, calm and sit on a, you know, a nice chest and coach. Again, that's cool. There's nothing wrong with that. There's some really successful coaches that do it. That's not how we do it. We're going to play with energy and passion. And and when we have our fans there, it just amps that up. And, you know, you, you better survive the first 15, 20, 25 minutes of the game, or it can get away from you fast. Um, because our, our team smells blood and they go after it. You know, they don't let off the pedal. That's not one of our challenges, although we do have some. Um, and, I love our fans. I love what this is. I love Razorback Nation. I love Northwest Arkansas. I just love all that this is about. It's a little bit of a chip on your shoulder state. It's a little bit of like all those things are like, that's a little bit what this is. And, and I love it. All right. And then let's just kind of, we'll, we'll wrap things up. Looking ahead at this last part of the portion of the season and then obviously in the postseason, where are you all continuing to evolve? And when you go out to train, uh, it seems like it's one of those situations where this is one of those teams that really kind of knows what it's what it's doing. But what are some things that you are really looking for as this, you know, as the calendar turns and as we get to the last few weeks? What are you, what are you really looking at now? Sets. We got to get a little better at sets. You know, we're taking a lot of corner kicks. We're not scoring enough our percentage that is our target. We're not there. Um, you know, we're, we're getting up some first contact on corners. Um, we got to get better in both boxes um, in terms of like the efficiency of chances and how those come and how we're getting them. Um, you know, and then we just got to develop some consistency. You know, this team has had some some highs and lows. Um, which is probably normal with most teams. We would like that level of consistency as the season goes on to get um, much more, like much more consistent rather than like the highs and the lows. Um, now we also play four of our last six at home and, you know, everyone's a little better at home, especially us. And, um, you know, we like how the schedule sets up and we're going to, we're going to work hard. I mean, there's some things we haven't done in my first two years. We had this, like we were building this like foundation. It had bricks that things have never been done in the program. There's like 32 things that we accomplished in our first two years that had never been accomplished. And now it's like final four national championship, undefeated conference record and conference term. That's it. Right. Like there's only a couple things left to do. And those are big goals. And so in order, we just say, Hey, in order for us to reach those goals, we have to be consistent in training because we have to be getting better. If we're just like, let's win this game. Let's win this game. When it comes time for those big games, we may not be ready. All right, coach. That's all I've got for you today. Super appreciate the time you've given me today and all of your insight. Um, good luck to you and the, and the rest of the squad the rest of the way. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir.